Alrighty, we are going to get started. Uh, welcome everybody to eConference 18. Um, we've got some nice nature background noises today, thanks to uh, Adam and Robin. So, oh, oh, throughout we can we can turn that on and off throughout. Um, so this is going to be a, a little bit more of a laid back eConference. It's sort of a transitional one now that we're in the summer. We can, if you start to look, you know, you can actually see there are people in offices, or at least one person was office. Emily is in office. There she is. Um, and now, Emily, I'm assuming this is a little bit better timing for you too. For you and Paige, I'm a lot more awake right now. <laughs> see, that's that's that works out perfect. So um, this is the the first time we're transitioning to the sort of the later afternoon, um, kind of bring more of the West Coast in for that, and uh, got a few of the um, recurring segments today. Uh, but this is kind of more of like a a, a mashup of updates. Um, Ken Brandt's been working through virtual field trips and, and, and virtual public shows now uh, for about a, 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 almost two months, probably, I think at this point. And, and one of the things that we're, we're really interested in in the weeks going forward is that as institutions start to open and as you get a little bit more of an idea of how your facilities are, are sort of responding to reopening or even if you just want to share how things have been going for maybe your, your streaming content or your virtual field trips, um, a great opportunity to kind of hear these individual case studies. And so uh, Ken's gonna share sort of his experiences and, and what he's learned over the past couple of months. And then of course, uh, how we're going to, to apply that moving forward. Um, we do have Renee Kerrigan here today. Um, Renee is gonna be giving us an update on GLOPA 2020. I'm not going to give anything away on that, but there's a if you haven't heard, there's a pretty big uh, update from her. Uh, and then we've got a, a segment with uh, Chris Sudor from uh, the Carnegie Science Center from the Buell Planetarium uh, about their story time project. And so every week they do story time for children, and there are a lot of views. It is a very, very popular, um, very, very popular segment for them. And so kind of get her feedback on, on how the institution has gotten permission for books and sort of what they've gotten in terms of comments and feedback and, and how, you know, if you're interested in doing something like that, uh, the sort of resources that can be pulled for those, um, uh, for something like that particular project. And then uh, three of our recurring segments today, uh, we have both of the Holtz, of course, on, on, on tap, uh, Jeff with astronomy apps, Mary with, with uh, podcasts, and of course, long German words of the week, but this time for yet another, uh, uh, another segment, um, Anna has a very special guest with her today and the longest word as of yet to make its debut on the, uh, the long German words of the week. It is 67 uh, characters long. The last longest one was 63. Uh, and I believe there is one longer that is sort of waiting. Okay, yeah, there's one that's waiting in the in the uh, in the the the, uh, the dugout, kind of waiting to get called in. Uh, we'll we'll see that one a little bit later in the summer. Uh, so other than that, um, I think the the big astronomy update of the week is there is one sunspot on the sun. So after a stretch of I believe like seventy days, there is a single tiny sunspot on the sun. So if you've been waiting to go out and look at something on the sun all year, I think now's the time to do it. Uh, but doesn't pose any threat for flares. So all of you in the Northern US, uh, you're probably not in any better shape for Aurora. So kind of unfortunate. Uh, but with that, uh, we'll go on ahead and turn it over to our recurring, uh, our, to our, um, our first segment today. Uh, Ken Brandt, Robeson Planetarium, Organization, Foundation, the Phoenix of the Planetariums, North Carolina. Ken, take it away. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, I hope. Yep, there it goes. And we'll go into slide mode here. Hopefully you're seeing most of the title page in orange. Don't care. Where did my mouse go? I lost my mouse. Okay, my cursor, I should say. My mouse is right here, but my cursor is gone. Anyway, all right. So, um, of course, I'm the director of the Robinson Planetarium in Lumberton, North Carolina. And this pr presentation is about lessons I've learned and things I'm applying as I'm doing virtual planetarium presentations, keeping a professional presence in a, in a pandemic. You know, nice alliteration going on there. Um, anyway. 
this uh, drives me right here, motivates me. That's the Robinson Planetarium, October 8th, 2016. And as you can see, that's a whole crap load of brown water um, up and around the planetarium and in the planetarium. It came up to about um, mid-thigh high at its height and toppled the Spitz A3, A3P projector, which was center mounted inside. Uh, the place is trashed. We're not going to rebuild there. Uh, when re if and when rebuilding happens, it will happen somewhere else on higher ground. But this motivates me. And when we got orders to stay at home on St. Patrick's Day, the um, you know I quickly began to plot and scheme. I said, I, I am not just going to sit here on my hands with, for however long this is going to take. Uh, it was becoming pretty clear it wasn't just going to be a two-week affair, as most people were talking about at the time. So I started doing teacher and services pretty much immediately. I got lists of third, fourth, and sixth grade teachers, which are the bulk of uh, the space science curriculum in North Carolina in the elementary grades and the early middle school. Um, got some articles written for the Robinsonian and started mashing content together from NASA videos uh, that I hadn't already done, um, put, putting together uh, pieces of, say, the, for example, the Perseverance videos and Curiosity videos mashing them together into something I could present as a show um, and began assembling virtual programming. And you're not going to tell me I'm not, I'm not going to get to teach. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, I think not. So um, so the, the in-services, I think, were the most valuable piece in the short term, along with the articles. I wanted to keep the planetarium's name and face in the community and you know, present as opposed to going under for quarantine or whatever. Uh, the virtual programs began March 28th in earnest, and um, all of them run on Zoom when I'm, when I'm controlling it anyway. Um, ID and password required. So far, I've not had any Zoom bombing, which is really good, fortunate for me. Um, people are muted on entry. Um, if it's a classroom setting or a group setting, whoever's in charge of the group is moderating the chat and there is no audio interaction. Um, I found it difficult from a interactive planetarium presenter modality, which is what I tend towards. I tend towards interactive presentations versus it's in the can play it uh, presentations. And so this has been a real challenge to dig interaction out of my audiences. And that's one place where I could use some help perhaps in figuring out how to be more interactive. Um, the topics, as you can see there, um, the, uh, I think my favorite program of them all is the SpaceX one that was done around the launch last week. Um, I, it was really motivating and um, pretty fun to do. But of course the Perseverance rover one is also pretty cool. Um, so those are my two favorites here in the list. All programs end with uh, Stellarium. And the settings I, I queue up for Stellarium, I set the time to 2100 local time, whatever that is for you, uh, for Western sky views, the apparition of Venus recently, and then of course, the appearance of Mercury um, being key parts of my evening sky show. And then of course, the morning sky show talking about um, Venus, Jupiter, no, excuse me, Jupiter, Saturn, and Mars. And I set the landscape to Mars, so I have a flat horizon, there's nothing, in between me and uh, you know, no trees or whatever uh, in the way of Mercury, for example. And a labeled object set to magnitude 5.0 of 5 so we don't get things like Vesta, you know, having to explain why you can't see Vesta in the sky as one example. Um, we've had several opportunities in the course of the outreach uh, to partner up with different institutions. Uh, the Bueller Planetarium down in Florida with Derek Demeter's um, and Justin Cirillo. Uh, we've done a couple of presentations about Mars um, where we all team up and we talk about different aspects of Mars exploration, which is a lot of fun. A um, couple of interactions with a gifted and talented magnet school in, in Raleigh, the Charlotte Astronomy Club, several public libraries to include the York Public Library, thank you, Carol, um, and um, Roper Mountain Astronomical Society are examples of where I'm doing outreach to groups or groups are coming to me and saying, hey, can you do something for us? Um, there's um, more outreach on the way. There's a virtual summer camp I'm gonna be working with inside the public schools 
um, for about a week about space science and exploration. And our media group, I just found out yesterday, they're doing a whole thing about space exploration. So I'm going to be partnering with them. Um, professional development has been very important to me during this uh, pandemic um, so I can stay sharp, you know, and on top of my game. Um, received, I'm mostly thinking about the received trainings from Digitalis, for example, and Dome Dialogues, the North Carolina Science Network, and um, the NISE Network. I didn't remember what the E stood for in the NISE Network. If anybody has that, please tell me. I'll correct my PowerPoint here. <coughs> a couple of marketing um, things that have worked really well for me. Uh, the, North the North Carolina Science Festival. Uh, the festival was in April, but they've continued to post updates about events happening throughout the state, and they've mentioned mine, and that's how I've gotten a couple of, a few of my um, outreach opportunities is through them. The uh, Solar System Ambassador Program, I'm going to make a quick pitch for them since we're here. Um, they've, you know, they provide um, a portal where you can put your events and post them on the network and they get announced uh, throughout the Solar System Ambassador community. So if somebody goes to that page, um, any events I'm doing upcoming, they'll be able to see them and go to them. Um, and this is an area, to be frank with you, that I need help in. I need a little bit of help in marketing. I'm not a marketing person. So I need a little help in figuring out what are other ways I can market my programs um, for consumption. And I have to give a nod to my boss. This is my boss at the podium there. Um, I just happened to pick this picture and didn't realize it until I loaded it in, into the slideshow here that I'm in the background there. You can see me standing up about three rows back. <laughs> So uh, that was kind of cool. But um, Dr. Locklear has been very supportive and basically whatever I want to do virtually or in person, he's like, let me know how it went. You know, so um, pretty, pretty nice to have that support at the right next to my administrative level, which is important to me. Uh, so impact, uh, over 2,500 screens reached. Now, when I say screens, I don't know how many people are behind that screen. So we have a really tough time gauging actual audience numbers. And um, for a small planetarium in rural North Carolina, that ain't bad. <laughs> so um, I was going to ask if you have other success stories. And if you do, uh, please send them to me. My email address is there. Um, <clears throat> I look forward to hearing about other people doing what, how it worked for them. So at this point, Michael, I want to turn it back to you. And um, maybe we can start a, a session about what other people are doing and how it worked for them. Absolutely, yeah. If you've got a, if you want to either raise your hand in the participants window, or um, put something in the in the chat, uh, for any of you that have been been working on on um, field trips and, and public shows and, and sort of in this virtual setting, uh, if you've got any feedback, please, this would be a great time for us to 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 take a listen. And Michael, can you stop my screen share because I'm having? I most a certainly can trouble with that. Thank you. All right, Guillermo, go on ahead. Hi, hello. So we we started uh, last week, this week, uh, our school field trips. And we are a little bit different in Brazil from US. We have a little bit more than a hundred planetariums in, in Brazil. And I don't know if anyone else is doing that in Brazil. So we are scheduling uh, field trips from all over the country, uh, literally. <laughs> and we have states that doesn't have a planetarium at all. So we are reaching people that don't have the the, the ways to, to go to a planetarium. Uh, that has been uh, very good, the, the students. We started just now, so they are already used it to get in the room uh, with the microphones off, uh, muted. So we, we don't mute them. We, we are uh, having the sessions with three of us. Well, we, we are three in the planetarium. And we all uh, stay during the, 
the virtual, virtual trip. So if something starts to go louder and louder, then we mute them all. But uh, I guess it happened just once. Uh, so they, they are already used to, to get in the room with the mics uh, muted. Uh, Marco, go on ahead. Okay, thank you. Well, here in, in Costa Rica, we started uh, our formal uh, service of virtual field trips based on astronomy and astronautics. Um, we haven't got a, a, any contract yet. And we, we, we think there are two reasons here in Costa Rica. Uh, first, uh, well, schools are still shut down and all of them are kind of behind their own um, curriculum or schedule. So they don't have time to add us into their, their online time. And there's also uh, something here that uh, most of our schools are public and they don't have the resources right now to, to pay us for, for the conferences. But our government usually hires us once uh, a year to make a planetary presentations. And this year they said, okay, can you go virtual? Uh, we said yes, uh, like a couple of months ago. So now that we formalized or made our service formal, pardon me, um, they said, okay, that's what we need. And if you can do it, we may even think about uh, more contracts for that. So that maybe by the end of the year, not yet, we're still closed here in Costa Rica. So we have to wait a little, bit. but uh, that's our status here. Great. Um, a question that I have actually um, for planetariums that are are directly connected to a school district or or are school planetariums. Um, now that we're entering into what would have been the off months anyway in the summer, uh, generally speaking, what's the expectation for your planetariums during the summer when you're not um, directly hosting K through twelve or K through question mark? sort of classes? What does a summer look like for the educational planetariums? Normally, um, we do public programs during the summer, um, and we also cater to summer camps and uh, other groups like that that uh, are looking for something to do. And normally, we'd have them come to the planetarium. Of course, in this case, we're trying to set up virtual visits with uh, working with a few of the summer camps already to set up virtual, to have virtual visits to, to our planetarium. Um, but yeah, it is a slower time, definitely for me anyway. Okay, and then just to make sure, um, this is this is summer break for Northern Hemisphere planetariums. If you're a Southern Hemisphere planetarium, uh, then it's uh, it is in fact the the winter time. Um, anyone else? Sean, go ahead. Yeah, we've had a little bit of a success with some virtual uh, field trips for schools. Um, a lot of the teachers did say that, that due to, you know, um, internet uh, connections to try to avoid doing video. So a lot of times they want more still still types of imagery when I'm uh, presenting and, and I've had uh, two or three of those um, this past week. Um, and then the other thing is we, we are working with our, uh, we have a local challenger learning center here that we partner with for joint visits. And um, they're gonna be doing online camps starting in July. And so uh, I'll be doing 10 sessions with them over the month of July, you know, as sort of kind of continuing that partnership, but in a virtual way, they're sending out uh, field trip camps and I've helped them put together some stuff for building Mars rovers and other things. And they're gonna send that out uh, sort of camp packets and then we'll be presenting for them. Um, so we've had, you know, a little bit of success. And I think the teachers have been happy that we, you know, that we have something to offer, even though it's, you know, it's not the same, but they, they do seem to be hungry to get back to the dome. A lot of them will say, oh, this is wonderful, but we, we, we can't wait till we get back to the dome. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully that'll happen, uh, in fall or early next year. Yeah, that, that's definitely good to hear. Amy, go ahead. Usually in the summer, our summers are almost as busy as our springtime, perhaps more so because we're doing weekday matinees for the public as well as daytime morning shows for summer camp groups. Um, one of my questions to the whole group is, you know, we've been doing virtual field trips for free for the spring with schools being in turmoil, but is anybody starting to charge for summer camps at doing a virtual field trip for a summer camp? We are. 
Amy. Yeah. In fact, uh, we even, we did charge the schools too. We charge a, a quarter of what we charge for our regular visits. So we charge, you know, we're charging $50 for a virtual session. Um, whereas we were doing 200 for our regular school groups. Um, but yeah, we're doing that for camps as well. We're, we're, you know, we're kind of trying to keep that at a level rate. So it brings in some income because we're cost recovery. Um, something I forgot to put in my slides. If you can align your content to your state standards or your country standards uh, for science education, that usually is a, is a big uh, hook. If you can tell people that are looking to book a show from you that, um, that you're aligned to their science standards already or even their STEM standards or math standards, uh, that, that can help a lot in marketing and getting more people to come through your door. Uh, there was one thing that came up on, on I think it was a Dome Dialogues post um, earlier this week. If you are using uh, a production system, not, not your in-dome computing rendering software, but a, say a production computer or a, a preview version of your, your software, um, there's oftentimes written into the user license agreements uh, prohibitions against using that software for making money. Uh, so giving shows with that software versus the, the official software that's in your dome. That said, do talk to your vendor, um, the, the go to whoever it is, Spitz, ENS, RSA, um, Zeiss now, go to them and ask for clarification on that because that line is beginning to blur and there may be opportunities for you or for them to change user license agreements that may allow you to use those production side computers for money-making streaming because of the unique nature of all of this. So do check in with your respective vendors. It's probably, um, uh, it's worth an email or a phone call. Uh, and most of the times that's going to get a, a yeah, and Skyscan as well. Um, you know, you could talk to Sean or, or, or someone on the team specifically for that, given that we're all aware that our customers are using the tools that we've given them. And the last thing we want to do is stand between a viable dome and uh, one that can't, um, one that can't charge because of a software license agreement. So uh, definitely reach out to your, your respective vendors and, and get that information. And, and if they haven't started that conversation internally, this may be something, this may be the impetus for them to do that. And that I hope would be better off for, for everybody here. So um, make sure to do that just so that you have the, the, the best available um, tools to be able to, uh, uh, to, to make this, this content. Uh, Noreen writes in the chat, are there any issues of using different astronomy software for Zoom sessions? Sky, you're starting at a pro instead of Stellarium or in addition to it? That is an excellent question that as a non-lawyer, I cannot legally answer. Um, but in some cases, if it's an open source, and that's, I guess, why everybody's using Stellarium, Stellarium has a set um, copyright, and you can, I think it's on the site, I believe it's, it's Creative Commons, as in as long as you are showcasing that it is in fact Stellarium and mentioning that you're using it, you can use it for anything. Uh, but then you have to check each of the individual softwares. Then again, it's like, who's, well, no, no, we, I will say nothing else on the matter. Check the, the, check with the software emails and, and phone calls are a good way to check them. So uh, that'll be a, a, a good thing to, to move forward with. Anyone else want to share? All right. Great. Well, thanks Ken for, uh, uh, getting a good conversation started. And of course, if you're interested in sharing anything that your teams have been doing uh, over the spring and now into the summer or fall into the winter, uh, just let me know and we will happily find uh, some places for them. Uh, next up is our Glippa 2020 conference update. We have Renee Kerrigan, who is the... Um, uh, the coordinator, the, the conference coordinator uh, on the Glippa side, and then um, uh, Mark Reed uh, from Kalamazoo. Uh, Renee and Mark, I will turn it over to both of you, uh, and you have the floor. Hi, thank you, Michael. Hello, everyone. Uh, 
And as Michael said, I'm Renee Kerrigan. I'm the GLIPA Conference Planning Chair um, and the Planetarium Director and Science Curator at the Peoria Riverfront Museum. And uh, my baby Rosemary is with me today. Here she is, eight weeks old. Um, so unfortunately, uh, as Michael hinted at, um, we had to announce this week that the GLIPA 2020 cancel, uh, 2020 in-person conference is officially canceled. Um, and I'm sure if you are a GLIPA member, you already saw that as we sent an email out to uh, membership and posted on our, our social media channels as well. Uh, it's disappointing to say the least. Um, I know I look forward to GLIPA all year long. It's one of the highlights of my year professionally. And um, that's why I was so excited to help plan the conference. And uh, Mark Reed, as well as his colleague, Steve uh, Crawford had done excellent work planning this conference. And um, we were, we were honestly ready to open registration. And that's why we had to make the call um, when we did that right at the time we were ready to open registration to GLIPA, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar with our, our regional um, meeting, it's always in the fall, it's in October, usually mid or late October. Um, right as we were ready to open registration, I started researching state reopening plans because I'm in Illinois and I knew that um, my state is restricting gatherings of, of more than 50 until there is a vaccine. And I thought, well, I better check on Michigan where the conference is expected, you know, is planned to be hosted. And uh, they're also restricting gatherings until there is a, a vaccine or either available and in wide use. So I reached out to Mark and Steve um, and they had already been thinking about it. Um, and there's a whole FAQ document on GLIPA's website, which I will put in the chat so you can look at it if you're interested. Um, but basically there were so, so many reasons uh, that would make a gathering in the fall very, very difficult and also unwise as probably bringing people together from all over the country while there is not a vaccine is, would not be advisable by epidemiologists, um, that we had to make the tough decision uh, to cancel the in-person conference this year. However, I wanna give kudos to Mark Reed, who um, very quickly worked with the hotel staff um, at the very nice Radisson Hotel that we had been uh, planning on using for GLIPA 2020. And we've already secured um, dates for GLIPA 2021, uh, the 2021 conference, which will be in Kalamazoo. And so um, all the good work that Mark and Steve did planning this conference will not go to waste. Uh, and it is in different, a, a slightly different date range than it usually is. GLIPA 2021 will be November 9th through the 13th. And that is because uh, those were the dates closest to the ho um, typical GLIPA date range that were available in the hotel. Um, so we are excited that we already have a plan in place and that we will be able to see you in Kalamazoo. It's a fantastic hotel location right next to the uh, beautiful museum and planetarium facility. So it's, it's really gonna be a great conference. Just will have to be delayed. And we are working on our plans for a virtual series of events in the fall, in the October uh, time that we typically host GLIPA. Um, we know that we can't have like eight hour Zoom sessions um, for the whole span of days that we would normally meet. So we're working on ideas for sort of um, spaced out, um, meetings, uh, virtual meetings uh, for the virtual GLIPA conference in 2020. And if you have ideas or uh, anything that you would like to see happen at those virtual conference, at that virtual conference, I welcome you to reach out to me. Um, and I'd be happy to, to chat about it with you. I will say we're, we'll plan to keep some of the key elements of a GLIPA conference at that meeting, such as the uh, astronomy update um, and other, other important parts of our GLIPA culture. 
Um, so I wanna pass it over to Mark Reed. Mark, if you have anything you'd like to add. Well, thank you, Renee. Um, we're really excited about being able to host it in 2021. It was very disappointing. I started out in the process of talking with the hotel and we had to book nearly three years out to get this particular venue. So when we had to shift it from October to November um, to take it out of their typical range, we thought that was a reasonable accommodation. So they've been very good to work with. I just signed the contract uh, an hour before I logged into here. So we're on our way that way. Um, most of the speakers that, when I say most, all of them have uh, said they would be happy to, to work with us for next year. So, you know, life happens. So we'll come back and revisit all of, all of those things. And right now I, I feel like we have a very solid footprint in moving forward. And we just hope that all of the, the unknowns and uncertainties that have popped into this year have um, come to some type of resolution and it's all positive. So I, I, it was really one of those things we had everything ready to go except launch the registration site. So we were on track and it was very disappointing, but looking forward, I think we're gonna be able to have a very good conference and kick things off the right way. I, I really thought of this as our Apollo 13 moment is we were most of the way out, poised to land, you know, and things were looking good and bang, <laughs> we've had to rework and I think we'll even be better in the future. So thank you to, to Steve Crawford, my uh, colleague and Renee and everybody on the GLPA exec and working through this um, particular anomaly. So thank you. Hey, thanks, Mark and Renee. And, and uh, one of the, the posts that was in the chat um, from Krista asking if there were gonna be charges to attend or participate. Uh, and Renee, I know you put it in there, I'll let you speak to that here in the, uh, in the, the Zoom itself. Sure, uh, we haven't gotten that far yet. Uh, we are working on planning our virtual uh, conference now. And um, so please don't take my, my words here as a final say, because um, I think our goal is just to serve our, our members and to keep costs as low as possible or possibly free if we can swing it. Um, but it just, I guess it depends on if we end up using um, a, a virtual conference uh, service that might cost money. Um, and, and, but anyway, our, we don't know yet, but our goal will be to keep um, to costs as low as we possibly can. Great. Possibly Great. free. Uh, any other questions for Renee or Mark uh, in regards to Glyph 2020 or Glyph 2021 at this point? Great. Well, thank you to both of you for, uh, for uh, coming out this afternoon, letting us know. So again, uh, Glipa 2020 uh, postponed, I think is how we'll, we can say it, postponed to November 21, um, still in Kalamazoo, Michigan. So uh, Mark and, and, and you know, we'll extend our thanks to Steve as well. We'll see you guys next year. Uh, and uh, of course, as we get updates, we'll have Renee and Mark and the rest of the Glipa team uh, to update us in the, in the, you know, the, the weeks, months and year and year are uh, so to come. So thank you both. All right, now we're gonna transition over to our next segment. Um, talking about the Carnegie Science Center's Buell Planetarium's Storytime Project uh, is Carissa Sador. So Carissa, take it away. Hi, thank you, Michael. Uh, so uh, our Storytime Program is something that we have really picked up a lot since our museum closed. Um, we had been doing in the planetarium when it was open uh, a, a frequent planetarium program called uh, Storytime Under the Stars. So uh, as kind of an attempt to do more super early learner programming, our museum does something called Munchkin Mondays, where it's usually once a month throughout the school year, uh, we have special programming catered to uh, pre-K students. 
Um, so we do a lot of different activities for them. And so in the planetarium, we do story time under the stars where we have a book. We usually have a reader sitting up at the front of the dome. We have a nice open space where we can put a chair and lay out a couple of sitting squares for kids to sit on, or they can sit in the seats with their parents uh, or guardians or whoever they're comfortable with. And um, we usually invite everyone in and we usually invite everyone to help us say goodnight to the sun and hello to the moon. And so they help us set the sun and bring out the stars. And then we will read a book. And it works really well in the dome because we have one presenter in the front reading and showing the kids the book. And we have one presenter in the console where we have a webcam hooked up. So they have a second copy of the book that we can project onto the dome. So people can see no matter where they're sitting, they can see the book, they can see the pictures. Uh, so that was always something really fun that we love doing. And it's something that we have tried to keep going now that we're working from home for now. Um, and we've seen a lot of success with it, doing story times over Facebook Live. Um, they've definitely been some of our more successful streams um, and they are super easy <laughs> to do. Uh, there's nothing easier that I'm doing right now than popping open a book like every Tuesday and reading it. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of things that you can find and you jump in. Uh, so we do not charge in the planetarium. Um, our shows are free. So there, our shows are included with admission. Um, so anyone who's in the museum can come and see a planetarium show. Um, Renee is who asked that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they're included. So, so we don't really have any issues with that kind of thing. Um, for reading them at home though, obviously we have to uh, find out what kinds of permissions are out there for different books. Um, and at the very start, we basically, my boss and I grabbed all of our story time books from the planetarium and took them home with us. And we have since added to our collection a little bit. Uh, but we started off by reaching out to a bunch of different authors and publishers to see what they would allow. Um, and that is definitely what I would recommend if you try something like do doing something like this, because all of the publishers seem to have their own specific guidelines that they want people to follow. Um, some publishers want you to delete your video after 24 hours. Some don't care if you leave it up forever. Uh, some of them do not want you to sh show both a full spread. They don't want you to show both pages at, a, at the same time. Uh, so it depends from publisher to publisher. Uh, but for the most part, especially with everything, uh, they have been really just enthusiastic to share and, and want everyone to be able to read their stories. So um, some of my favorite ones that I have done so far, uh, we did Margaret and the Moon. Um, this is all about Margaret Hamilton. So it's the story of Margaret Hamilton uh, and it is by Dean Robbins and Lucy Nisley. And it's a very, very cute book all about uh, the first lunar landing and kind of the work that Margaret Hamilton did and, and growing up and how she got into what she was doing. Um, and they're really fun and it's the perfect length. Uh, it's not too long. Um, some of my other favorite ones, my very favorite ones, I think, um, there are three in this series. Well, technically four, I guess, but three space ones. Uh, there's one for the sun, the moon, and the earth. Um, so this is Sun, One in a Billion, and it is by Stacy McAnulty. Um, it is so much fun. Uh, these books are so much fun. They characterize these objects. Uh, they are such a blast to read, and they take you through, yes, I am a star, a massive ball of luminous gas and energy and an outstandingly talented performer. Like it's, a, I had a lot of fun reading this one. Um, and the earth and the moon books are really great as well. A lot of these authors do have series. So you can usually find multiple books. Um, there are some that, uh, another great series is the Ordinary People Change the World series um, by Brad Meltzer. So we have, uh, I, I did an Amelia Earhart one on the anniversary of her uh, first solo flight across the Atlantic. And we also have, I am Neil Armstrong. So it's all about Neil Armstrong. So there are usually a bunch of series uh, that you can find with pertinent information in them. Oh, thank you, Anna. 
Yeah, Margaret and the Moon was a lot of fun too. I think that was one of the first ones we did uh, at the very start of all of this, so. Uh, yeah, and it is still posted. Yeah, so some of them, I think some of the publishers have their policies um, lasting through June 20th. I don't know if they're going to extend those policies or they're going to change after that time because I know a lot of um, places are reopening now. So um, I definitely, we're going to keep checking after that because I think we're still planning on doing this even when our museum uh, reopens. So right now we're set to reopen uh, June 29th. So I think we're, we're still definitely aiming to do as much virtual programming as we can uh, in addition to, you know, in-person programming. So, but yeah, we have a lot of uh, different stories and it's really easy to find. What I recommend doing is you can even just search Amazon for space books for kids. Uh, and because of the algorithm there, it'll link you to a whole bunch of different ones. And then you can do what I do and go find those on a local bookstore website and order them from your local bookstore. Uh, so there are a lot of different ways to find. There's just a ton of them out there. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start off with one. Um, for members and, and uh, audience attendees who have seen it both in the Dome and online, um, what's the feedback been in terms of, of moving the content from the Dome setting to having it be just a, a, a streaming video online? How's the feedback been on, 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 on the, all that? Um, we've gotten really positive feedback. Uh, people have really been enjoying the, the virtual stream, I think we found that, you know, and I mean, it makes sense. Kids love being read to. So um, they also like to kind of participate in it. So often while we're reading, we'll ask them questions and, you know, type in the comments how big you think the sun is or whatever. Um, so we're still trying to keep that kind of interaction in there and doing it as a Facebook Live helps with that kind of thing. Um, so people have been really, really positively, you know, uh, people have been really positive about the whole thing. And I think they are just eager to have any kind of connection with the planetarium, even if we're not in it. Uh, they have, they have, it's been overwhelmingly positive. Great. Uh, in the chat, um, Gary Lazich uh, recommending Jeffrey Bennett, uh, his, the series about the dog Max going somewhere. Uh, in the solar system, the ISS, to the moon, to Mars, and to Jupiter. And then Jeff Holtz recommending Dean Robbins, who is a local in Madison, Wisconsin, uh, who did a presentation about his book, The Astronaut Who Painted the Moon, the true story of Alan Bean surrounding their anniversary celebration of Apollo 12. Very nice. Uh, anyone else uh, questions, uh, you, similar experiences that you've done with story times uh, in the dome? We'd love to hear it. It's a great thing to try and do. I highly recommend it. And I, again, cannot stress how easy it is, how easy it is to just crack open a kid's book and read it. Um, and it, again, like they are definitely some of our most popular streams on our page. Uh, every, every story time gets over easily over a thousand views. Um, so they are super popular. They're, they're very easy. People are, people are loving them. Um, my boss, uh, Mike Hennessy, who I don't think is in the call right now, but he um, is a very accomplished clarinet player. So he has been adding his own flair to things where uh, he read a book about, I think, an Apollo launch. And so to help count down and have everyone join in the countdown, he did a clarinet countdown. So he played his clarinet a little bit to help people <laughs> count along. So there are so many different things you can do uh, to make it, you know, to add a little bit of flair to it. Um, usually I'm just reading them because I am not an accomplished clarinet player, but uh, I try to do what I can <laughs> on my end. Uh, but uh, it's a lot of fun. It's just a fun way to interact with people. Great, great. Uh, Dario, go ahead. Uh, hello. Um, we have a, a monthly program not exactly at the planetarium, but uh, at the science center, uh, in which um, Charles' book is dissected for all, for all the science it contains, and there are uh, experiments made with uh, small kids. 
usually from the three to seven, perhaps eight years old. Um, we have also adapted some of those stories to the to, to the dome. We have a protocol with with a local publisher, uh, which which has the, the the rights for for Portugal for 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 some stories, and we are allowed to to even modify slightly the drawings to adapt them to adapt them to to the dome. Some of the stories we have also been allowed to animate. So we can we have the characters in story move move around or, or always very simple animations. Uh, the story is is read live usually by someone in the dome, um, and it's been also a very successful program. We usually f full every every month. Great, Renee, go ahead. I was just curious um, if you plan when you are say you're back open uh, to how you used to be pre pre COVID. Um, do you think you'll do your events in person and live stream them? Like, will you continue this content? I know my museum is talking about how successful some of our our live streams have been and our virtual content is, has been and how we're going to balance doing our normal operations with continuing our virtual content. Uh, yeah, we're trying to figure that out right now. <laughs> um, so I, we definitely do want to continue doing as much virtual content as we can. Um, it's going to be a bit reduced since a, a lot of us are going to be back in the building. So we will be kind of split between um, doing our in-person presentations. Um, but we definitely want to plan at least starting in the fall to do more uh, and more consistent virtual programming. And we're trying to work that into our workloads in the future because it's not something that we really had done in the past. And I'm sure everyone here is kind of in the same boat, uh, at least definitely not to this degree. So uh, it's something that's kind of being written into our, our, our lives now. Um, and we're trying to plan for that more because we definitely want to be able to continue doing this. Um, I don't know in what capacity we'll be doing story times specifically online. Um, I think a lot of that too is gonna depend on what the publishers will allow um, since a lot of their, their, um, their well, relaxed guidelines are kind of cutting off at the end of the month. Um, so if they if they decide to extend that, then I think we would like to keep doing them. So, so we're kind of playing it by ear at this point. Great. Uh, Paige makes a, a good uh, point in the chat um, that maybe as people return to normal, we'll see fewer virtual uh, attendees. And that, of course, is something that we would want to uh, keep in mind and keep an eye on. Sort of as the 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 months progress and as we move more and more towards the reopening or normal or whatever it is that we're calling it, um, how that is going to translate. And so, uh, again, um, like we've said, keep this in mind if you'd like to talk about. Do you see big changes in the way you've been doing things and now how you're going to do them as time goes on? Please reach out and let us know. That's the kind of information, the kind of case studies we'd like to uh, to show off. Um, Jeff, go on ahead. Yeah, I am hoping to still do virtual events even when things go back to normal. Um, because I got this like heartwarming uh, email from um, a, a woman who just found the planetarium with her husband uh, a few months before we shut down and had made it to one planetarium show and then because of her husband's health hadn't they had been buying tickets to each of the the public shows and then i kept seeing that they they weren't showing up they were you know donating money to the the planetarium and still not being able to attend and she sent this uh message after one of our virtual events how much uh, she appreciated being able to participate even though they, they couldn't leave the house. And so I think there's going to be uh, a population that we can reach out to that will appreciate it. So one way or another, we're going to continue. Oh, absolutely. Uh, anyone else before we move on? I will say that doing them on Facebook Live 
is uh, has has been a great it's been a great option for us. Um, if that's an option for anyone else, I highly recommend it because uh, it's free. <laughs> um, and it, it lets us easily track, you know, how many people are watching and how many people watch it later. Uh, so it lets us keep track of really how much engagement we're getting. And we've been getting a lot of engagement. I think I've, I've definitely been surprised. It's been a lot more engagement than I would expect. Um, so it's, it's kind of a low risk endeavor and, and we're definitely going to still plan on doing different kinds of virtual programming. This is not the only thing we're going to be doing, um, as like story time, we're going to be doing different kinds of presentations too. Uh, but this has been kind of a good like experiment for us. So, uh, it's definitely something I would recommend trying. And Guillermo makes a great point, uh, you know, in, in Brazil, the, the spaces between some of these planetariums and the audiences that they're serving could be hundreds or thousands of kilometers. And more importantly, by having all of this online content, we're able to serve communities and audiences that may never get the chance to come to our facilities, but now we can reach out to them in a way that we just, we didn't have before. Mm -hmm. There's a reach that, that you know, yeah, that, that might be the great thing of all of this is that we go back to the domes, we see eventually we would hope the same sort of audience numbers, but keep that virtual reach. And now we've just expanded our audiences even more. Mm -hmm. um, Toshi asks you, Carissa, would you recommend Facebook Live or YouTube or over YouTube? Um, I think it depends on kind of where your organization has has its presence for the most part. Um, our or my organization, the Science Center is really active on Facebook. Um, and especially right now, we've kind of set up the expectation for all of our our followers, you know, people who are following our page every day they know to expect um, it's CSE's three things. So every day we post something to read, to watch, to do. Um, so that has been set up kind of as an expectation. So and and I think I think that people are kind of just on Facebook passively, like all the time. So what's nice about Facebook Live too, is anytime a page you're following goes live, it gets a notification gets sent right away. So people are notified very easily for Facebook Live videos. So I think that's also been kind of a big reason why we've gotten the numbers that we've gotten because it, it kind of does the work for us as far as getting the word out. Um, but also that's, that's where our audience is. Um, our audience is a lot on Facebook. Uh, also from a um, interaction standpoint, because you have the, the chat going live, do you see and experience any interaction during the, the presentations? Uh, yeah, we do sometimes. Um, it, it, it varies um, and it depends on, you know, if there's a lot of people watching, we tend to get a bit more. Um, I think we tend to get a lot more of our viewership happen after the live video ends. So uh, sometimes there isn't a whole lot, but it is nice every so often, you know, we'll, we'll have parents posting questions and we'll be able to answer them. So it is a nice option. Um, usually they are pretty quick. Uh, we try to keep them to about 20 minutes long um, just to go along with the average child's attention span. Um, but also that's about how long these books are and it, and it works out pretty perfectly. Um, so if people do have questions, they are able to answer, ask them and we're able to kind of chat with them. Um, and yes, I do read the books. <laughs> I read them and a couple of my coworkers read them. So we, we, we share the load, uh, but thank you. Uh, Anna writes, uh, we've actually dropped using Facebook Live in Berlin because they get better works from YouTube, but that could be a regional thing as Facebook is not as popular as Germany as is in the US, uh, but you still do have all of the analytics in YouTube. Um, pay attention to your community, very, very, uh, important. Um, Anna, have has Berlin done any any of the story live streams, or is it just star shows at this point? Um, it's just star shows. We only live stream once a week, um, trying not to oversaturate, um, and so we change what the topic is every week when we present. So, um, like yesterday, um, Tim Florian Horn did the Astronomy Actuel, which is an astronomy update, um, and. Uh, 
two weeks before that I did one in English. Um, and then the week before that I think was a children's program. So we do switch it up between adult and children programming. I think we have another kids program coming up shortly. Um, so we try to have something for everybody. Oh no, sorry, next week is a music program. And then I think after that is a kids program again, because we've also been doing concerts in the dome that we've been streaming with local artists. Very cool, all right. Uh, anything else before we segue to Anna? Great. Well, thank you, Carissa, for, uh, and, and Carissa said she wasn't going to be able to fill 15 minutes worth of information. I'm like, no, there's no chance. This is an interesting topic. Uh, so yeah, if anybody ends up doing this, or if you get a really, really good book, um, like I, I believe um, there's no place like space uh, is not available that the, the, that book and, and the issues with that I don't think that's one that's been allowed yet, so. Yeah, that's true, uh, because I, I was actually the scientific reviewer for There's No Place Like Space, and I went to the author and to the, um, the Seuss family, and they turned me down for permission. Wow, wow. Um, actually, that would be a great idea. If we, uh, I'll put together a document, uh, an editable document on the Dome Dialogues resource page uh, for all books and publishers that you have had access uh, to or had conversations with um, so that we can have kind of a central area where people can go and look and see, all right, these are the books that are, are known to be good. This is known publisher rights and, and kind of we'll try to keep that updated as we move through the, um, the next couple of months. So, uh, so thank you, Carissa. Thanks Amy for that update as well. And now we'll uh, transition over to Pretty much everybody's favorite recurring segment of the week. Um, it is a very special edition of Long German Words of the Week. Ladies and gentlemen, all the way from Berlin, Anna Green. Hi, everyone. Uh, back for week nine of Long German Words of the Week. And I have uh, native speaker Brian here with me again, popping in from the moon. Um, so, uh, we are going to um, be sharing three more long words with you. Um, as Michael already said, we will be having our longest word of the week so far um, to date, which was uh, again, 67 letters long. So um, we'll get to that, but uh, we'll go ahead and start with uh, word one. Word number one. Sommer Sonnenwende. Summer Sonnenwende. So is that the summer wind or the summer solstice? Okay, so now, now I need to, is it gonna bother me if I don't look it up? The band that sang Summer Breeze. Seals and Croft, 1972. I have that song i don't know i only know it because it, martin sang it on the simpsons in that one episode with the pool the the summer wind came blowing in from across the sea is that frank sinatra who did that <laughs> i don't know but right. yeah looks, looks like we've got most of the votes in right now and uh looks about two-thirds of you say summer solstice a third of you say summer wind Anna, what is our correct answer today? That is the summer solstice. So nice, nice long way to say summer solstice. Very nice. Very nice. All right. <laughs> All right. So moving on to word number two. Lockerungsmaßnahmen. Lockerungsmaßnahmen. So is that easing measures or quarantine? I don't have anything pithy to say about this one. <laughs> I always try to have at least one that's topical. There we got 90% of the votes in. It's not going to change too much. 60% say easing measures. 40% say quarantine. Anna, what is the correct answer today? 
you guys are on a roll today. It is easing measures. So um, loco or loco hong is easing. Um, and then mas namen would be measures, quite literally, just the two put together. So. Nice. All right. And now uh, we were on to word three. And so this was the, the special. Um, before this, our longest word was 63 letters long. Um, we're happy to say that this one is 67 and will require you, as I just did now, to resize the polling window. It's so long. That's what she said. So here we go. Launch the polling. Grundstücksverkehrsgenehmigungszuständigkeitsübertragungsverordnung. Grundstücksverkehrsgenehmigungszuständigkeitsübertragungsverordnung. So is that the violation of a parking permit ordinance or a real estate permit transfer ordinance? So Anna, how do you say he's a keeper in German? Uh, <laughs> that, That's I probably too that much of really a good translation. Yeah. Of a... I think Sean has it right. Uh, that is in fact a sentence and not a word. <laughs> Oh, um, kannst du noch einmal, bitte? Grundstücksverkehrsgenehmigungszuständigkeitsübertragungsverordnung. So we had a request to hear it one more time. Um, I will say that he told me today that this one's easier to say than the last one that he did. Even though it's longer, it flows easier mm, mm. for him. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, this, this one has some people stumped. We're only at 80% of the votes in. Oh, no, no, now we've got some, we have some movement again. Okay, we're, it's been a minute and a half, so we're gonna give it this one. Uh, about 55% say a real estate permit transfer ordinance. The others say, oh, no, no, now it's 50. Oh, thanks everybody. <laughs> it's just 50-50 between everything. So there's an ordinance involved. Is it just a permit transfer? Is it a violation of parking permit? And with 93% of the vote, it is now 50-50. This is like a Florida election right here. Um, <laughs> so Anna, what is the correct answer? So um, Grundstück um, is like literally piece of ground. So real estate. Um, and then, yeah, we just go on with many more words meaning permit transfer ordinance, so. <laughs> Wow. Yep. And so yep. there, there's our, our longest German word yet at 67 letters. Uh, wow. Incredible. So uh, let's, um, let's see a quick show of hands. Who got all three correct this week? Oh, wow. Well, uh, John, you don't count. You speak German. <laughs> uh, how many of you, um, how many of you think that two out of three ain't bad? Okay. And then did anybody just fail miserably and go over? Oh, oh, very, that's all right. Oh, Marco as well. Okay. So, uh, you know, and, and, and because Patty's not here, um, we're just going to give her, um, we'll give her a ceremonial two out of three. Today. Like we'll just <laughs> let her know next week. And, so, and I will say for, for those of you who um, hopefully aren't getting too frustrated by this, if, if you're missing one of them, um, I have been told multiple times by native speakers that they're glad that they don't have to learn this as a second language and that it, they just grew up knowing it. So, which is a great motivational speech there. So um, don't feel too bad. It, it is, it is a, a difficult and tongue twisting language at times, but also very, very beautiful, particularly if you listen to some of the operas and stuff. So um, yeah. Great. So thanks then, again for playing and we'll, we'll see you next time with more long German words. And as always, Anna will be posting these in the chat and in the event page. So you will not have to um, go back and reconstruct these words. Uh, you can just yes. go into their, their, their uh, linguistic history. So thank you, Anna and Brian, both of you for, for your, your, uh, your hosting this afternoon. Uh, so we'll stop those results. Uh, and move ourselves on to our next segment this week, which is the Astronomy Apps for your at-home planetarium audiences. 
Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Holt. Now, to be clear, I think it's more about psychology than trying to figure out the, the German word. It's more like, how is Anna trying to trick us this week? That's the teacher in me though, Jeff. And that's the teacher in me seeing the teacher in you. Mm -hmm. May the teacher in all of us see the teacher in all of you. Oh. All right, so um, my uh, astronomy app uh, this week that I'd like to share uh, is actually available as just a, a website, uh, Android or iOS. Many of you that have uh, telescopes and observe uh, probably already know about these, um, but it's to check and see uh, what the weather is going to be like tonight uh, for observing. And so I, um, I'm usually you know, passing on these recommendations when people are uh, borrowing our telescopes. So let me go ahead and share my screen. working on it. Okay. Um, so it shows up this way on the, uh, the website as well. And uh, so it's the clear sky chart. And the way you read it uh, is, you know, line by line here, darker is better. And so you can see in the cloud cover line here, uh, it's predicting that we will have uh, clear skies tonight. By the time it gets dark, one of the reasons I like uh, this version better uh, than the other app uh, that I mentioned uh, that I'll also show you um, is that it has the darkness line here. So it's got, you know, cloud cover, transparency, seeing, darkness, all of the things that you appreciate for uh, observing in the night sky. And really, you know, very simple to work with. Uh, you can either find your uh, self on the map um, zooming in and out to uh, find your location or uh, one of these charts uh, near you. Uh, or you can do a search. So I just clicked on all charts here and you can scroll through or you can uh, type in a search. And then I just favorite uh, the one I want to be able to come back to. Uh, and that's all there is to it. Now uh, for Android, this particular app is not available. Obviously on the web, it's available however you want. Uh, but then for um, Android users, this one called uh, Astrospheric is available for both iOS and Android. Uh, some people say it's a prettier version. Um, to me, there are things that I like about it uh, better, but I still use the clear sky chart more. This has the uh, cloud cover on this line and then transparency on this line and seeing on this line. And they use the same data source. So I'm not sure why the prediction in Astrospheric is different for us uh, tonight compared to uh, the other app. Um, it does not have the darkness line that uh, the other app, the Clear Sky Chart uh, app has, but it does have uh, height of the sun, sunset, uh, sunrise, so you can figure out when uh, astronomical twilight would begin. You also have moonrise and uh, moonset times as well. Uh, one of the things that uh, this app has that the other one does not have is the extended forecast, but often that's not very uh, dependable beyond you know the next 36 hours anyway. Uh, and scrolling down a little further, uh, it does have moon phase information and right down to pretty much the uh, neighborhood of where your location is set for. Um, so that's it for uh, me this week. Just a way for you to uh, check and see what the cloud cover for forecast is like. Great. Well, thank you, Jeff. It's always super useful. Um, I've got a small new telescope on the way, which means that Eastern Pennsylvania is going to be rained out for like the next three weeks. So guaranteed. Um, our next segment uh, is supposed to be uh, Mary Holt's pandemic podcast thingy. Um, 
I don't believe that Mary is yet in the room. It is because she is currently running a live feed for uh, Cal Academy at the same time. So um, what we can do before she gets here, and I know she's she is on her way, um, because it is Friday, uh, it is time for best parts of the week. And so we try to have that little glimmer of hope uh, every week in the times of, in these trying times, uh, we just want to make sure that everybody stays uh, focused on the good stuff. So if you've got a best part of the week that you'd like to share, please feel free. Um, we'll just open the floor for all of that. So uh, if you've got a best part, go on ahead. Yesterday was a holiday in Hawaii, so I have no idea what day it is. <laughs> so is it, would you consider that a best part? Yeah. Just having no, okay, great, great. <laughs> My husband, my husband just made this rocket for me. Well, he's been making it for a week or two. Let me get it where you can see it. <laughs> can you see the flames? <laughs> anyway, I can't wait to move it into my planetarium. <laughs> Fantastic. That, that's impressive. Uh, uh, any other best parts this week or show and tell? I mean, honestly, um, if, if it's show and tell, Mark is always like, he can just go into the back and pull something. I, I got official approval to um, take vacation time in October to hopefully be able to fly home and see my family in the United States. So fingers crossed that international travel is once again a thing for the time frame around when Glippo was supposed to be. All right, anyone else with a best part they'd like to share this week? Uh, I have a best part, but it may also be Chris's best part of the week. Oh, and there's Mary Holt. Um, so I was driving the Philadelphia, the Philadelphia, the Pennsylvania Turnpike last yesterday um, from an undisclosed location back to Philly. And um, Chris and I decided that we were going to meet up at like 2.30 in the afternoon at a random Chipotle right off the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Uh, and so we had our socially distanced uh, lunch meetup in the parking lot with the windows down and burrito bowls in hand. So uh, it was nice to see a, yet another human being in the flesh um, and not just here on the screen. So that, that was really nice. That indeed was also going to be my best part. Yeah, sorry to steal uh, that. I'm wow. glad you took it seriously when I said, literally, let's meet on the side of the turnpike. I'll just say hi and you can keep driving. So yeah. I'm glad yeah. that worked out. <laughs> yeah, and, and then the biggest problem was is that we were in um, Crown, Cranberry Township, Pennsylvania, which for some reason has two Chipotles within one mile of each other and had to specify it's the one going north-south, not the Chipotle running east-west. Uh, we were able to do that without um, without too many problems. So that worked out pretty well. Uh, Amy, I saw your microphone open a little bit earlier. Uh, you can go in ahead. Uh, my best part is that my daughter finally finished all of her remote learning. So she has officially finished high school, but graduation won't be until July 13th. She's very excited. <laughs> is that a, it, will that be a virtual or in-person graduation? It will be in person. At that point, we'll be allowed to have, New Jersey will allow groups of 500. So we'll have 90 graduates with four family members each, and they will do six graduations that week. Wow. wow. Two a day. <laughs> God and bless the administration. That's, hey, you gotta do what you gotta do. Um, any other best parts of the week? Well, I actually got this last week. It goes with your graduation, but my uh, master's degree certificate arrived in the mail. So I also graduated with an MS this year, virtually. So. Congratulations on that. Anyone else? All right, well, now that we've done best parts and Mary Holt has entered the room, um, we can turn it over for our final segment this week, 
Uh, that is the Pandemic Prima Podcast Party for your Planetarian. Ladies and gentlemen, Mary Holt, straight from the live streams. Yeah, <laughs> sorry for being so late. I just came directly from uh, our Friday live stream. Uh, we had a uh, Micah from Open Space uh, flying around and chatting with Josh. It was really cool. If you guys want to go check it out, uh, they just kind of flew around the moon and um, the universe a little bit. But anyway, uh, I am not quite as prepared as normal for today's PPP PFP. Uh, but I do have some stuff to share with you. If you haven't seen one of my uh, shows before or whatever, I just recommend a uh, podcast for all of us, especially since we're all stuck at home for at least for now. Some of us are starting to go back to work and everything. But um, this has been a very uh, difficult week for many, many reasons. But um, one thing I was able to do on Wednesday, um, I know some of us were participating in the uh, the uh, uh, shutdown STEM strike for Black Lives on Wednesday, um, and so that day I took the whole day to just kind of do some research and compile info and donate places and et cetera, and think about like ways to improve our work um, in the Planetarium at the Academy specifically. Uh, but one of the things I did was start to just kind of compile a really long Google doc of different resources I was finding. And as a subset of that, I'll just post this in the chat. Oh, this looks weird, but um, was some podcasts I've listened to recently that are relevant for the time that we are in right now and helpful for um, educating myself on topics. So I'll just post these real quick. So uh, some of the ones that I jotted down that I've listened to recently are there was a couple of episodes of Code Switch, um, uh, one of which has the same guest that was also on this Unladylike episode that I'm recommending here too, which has a wonderful uh, title in my opinion called How to Not Be a Karen, something that <laughs> many of us are sh should learn. Uh, but uh, also a shortwave episode from a little while back was about, um, experiences of people of color in science uh, fields specifically, uh, some about uh, coronavirus and, and race and how that intersects. And uh, the Story Collider episode was actually from a while ago. I'm not sure what the date was for this one, but I listened to this several weeks ago, um, but it's pretty relevant too. It's also kind of about like uh, a couple of stories from uh, someone who is a native Hawaiian and then the other person I believe I remember the native Hawaiian story stuck in my head more, but um, his experience in uh, the science field getting, trying to get uh, different degrees and stuff and the challenges that came with that. And, oh yeah, and one very recent one from It's Been a Minute has, was about uh, the protests and kind of the history behind protests in the US surrounding uh, inequality and racism and whatnot. So those are just a few that I have. I can add these to the slideshows later. It's been a busy week, but I have these and hopefully they're helpful. And thank you all again for listening to me uh, talk to you about podcasts for a few minutes. Thank you, Mary. Uh, so now, of course, uh, we're, we're very much near the end. Uh, we're in open forum. Um, so I'm just putting a link there in the chat. Uh, tomorrow is the final day for the submission of abstracts for the Western Alliance e-conference. That's the 27th and 28th of July. Uh, and uh, what was going to be in in um, in Casper this year in Casper, Wyoming, um, instead is going to be online. And so uh, feel free to to submit that. I know we've got uh, you've got 24 hours at this point, uh, but just wanted to keep that on everybody's uh, radars. Uh, that the abstract uh, deadline is tomorrow for the WAC e-conference. Uh, but of course, we're an open forum. That means it's open floor. Whatever you'd like to to add or talk about, please feel free. Uh, so we'll, we'll open up the floor if anyone has anything they'd like to discuss. I'm just grateful that we can all get together like this. Thank you. That's good. Yeah. 
Um, I would like to uh, make a special thank you to Mike Francis, who uh, portrayed Galileo last night in the virtual hospitality suite. Um, he went above and beyond his normal uh, performance uh, with her and had, had to actually uh, call it quits because the audience did not want to let him go. Um, but uh, he did a fantastic job and very entertaining. If you do have a chance at some point to have him perform Galileo at your dome, uh, definitely worth it. He's really good. Yeah, and I think, I think we're definitely gonna talk to Mike and see if we can have him maybe a little bit more structured for uh, an e-conference, but have him kind of come in and, and maybe talk about the craft as much as the, yeah, I, the what he what he, who he is as Galileo and he becomes Galileo, and and yeah. you, you want to meet the Doge and everything. It's I I think you know that's sort of what was developing last night is that after an hour of it, people were going like hey, maybe I could do this, or maybe there's a, another story that could be developed. And so having him talk about uh, what was involved in putting the, the program together um, could be really valuable. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, any, anything else for Open Forum or for the good of the order? It's just Susan, a reminder that we are so close to the summer solstice. And if anybody wants to measure their shadow at local noon, you can do it anytime, probably in the next week or so. And then if you wait, well, check online for what time the sun gets to be equivalent to the local noon high for December. Um, so for me, I'll, I already did it at one o'clock this afternoon and I'll measure my shadow at 6 p.m. today on my poster board and then I will be able to share that with students and say, look at how it changes. Great. Susan, go on ahead. So I usually just I just posted a link to the portable planetarium resources because excuse me, we're putting on uh, some more information on how to um, keep the momentum with your program and also how to open up um, some, um, we're going to be posting in the next few days some information from manufacturers on how to clean their domes, uh, some suggestions for seating uh, positions, etc. Great, thanks, Susan. Emily, go on ahead. Going off what uh, Amy said about uh, summer solstice, sorry, I'm. <laughs> um, do you guys see that there's going to be a solar eclipse that's going across India and China the day after the solstice? Mm. Solar eclipse. Like, I know it's not across the US, but it is something that I think a majority of humanity is probably going to be able to see at least a partial eclipse. I'm debating whether or not to write about it in any of our social medias. It's an annual. Uh, yeah, I went on ahead and posted the the Wikipedia page. Wow, that is something else. The greatest eclipse lasts 38 seconds. That is a short one. The 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 umbral band will be 13 miles wide at its widest. It's That's... an annular eclipse. So you can oh, also yeah, pull yeah. in talking about uh, super moons and micro moons. Excellent. Well, thanks for that update, Emily. That's because we're bound to get a question, and all of a sudden, it's like, oh, oh, well, you know, let's <laughs> let's, let's. It seems a bit date. ominous, like solar eclipse after the after the summer solstice, and a good portion of humanity is going to be able to see it. it. Feels very ominous in this time. And then, uh, just for for um, you know, to make sure we've just got everything covered, there will be a total solar eclipse this year. December 14th, except it cuts across southern Chile and Argentina uh, with a duration of two minutes and 10 seconds. So that's December 14th. Uh, and then there's a couple of, looks like two penumbral lunar eclipses in between that nobody's going to care about. So um, we'll see. Anything else this afternoon? Uh, Emily, you're going to be presenting with Talepa on Thursday. Him, oh yeah, that's happening. <laughs> the people. Yeah, yeah. It's. I have, I have a lot of stuff happening. I forget about things. 
This is what happens when we get Emily at 9 a.m. instead of 6. Or 8 a.m. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, we want to hire you. This is what we're going to do. And the form on the... So that is Thursday. And Emily and Kalepa, uh, Hawaiian Navigator, are going to be presenting with Derek at the Florida virtual something. Yeah? Yeah, so I, I need to test some things for the dress rehearsal for that. But yeah, we'll be putting the Iniloa Planetarium on your computer and talking about some introduction to navigation or modern day navigation. I just described each one and just made it very cool. Make it very, very cool. clear that. All right. Anything else today? It's more open form than usual. Uh, all right. So with that, I think we are good to go. And of course, um, well ahead of schedule. It was a, a tight 90 minute e conference. So uh, let everybody know uh, next week's schedule is one of the lighter weeks. We have a Wednesday e conference at noon and then a virtual hospitality suite at nine. Uh, so we hope to see you all at one of those next week. Uh, still working on uh, content for that. So if you're interested in giving a presentation, you've got anything that you'd like to. Uh, to present, please let me know. Just reach out, and we'll we'll happily uh, get you into some of the um, into the the conference slots. But until then, um, as always, you're all unmuted. Have a great rest of the day, and we will see you all next week. Hey, bye. 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 <laughs>